discussions of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Terry Ball, professor of ancient scripture in the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University, and I'm joined today for this discussion by three of my colleagues, also from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Seated next to me is Professor Paul Hoskison. Welcome, Paul. So glad to have you with us. Thank you. Also joining us today is Professor Clyde Williams. Thanks for being here, Clyde. Thank you. And also joining us, and we're always delighted to have Professor Gay Strathern with us. Good to have you, Gay. Thanks. Today we're going to continue our discussion of the Book of Mormon, and we're going to begin with uh, 1 Nephi chapter 3. A little bit of the setting here. Lehi and his family have fled Jerusalem at the instruction of the Lord. They've traveled probably over 200 miles down uh, by the shores of the Red Sea. They're camped um, in the Valley of Lemuel by the River of Laman. We don't know how long they've been there, but one day Father calls the boys in and says, folks, we want you to go back to, uh, back to Jerusalem. This has probably been a two-week a two week trip away from Jerusalem. We want you to go back and get the plates. One of the questions that always comes to my mind is, why didn't they take the plates with them when they left the first time? Yeah, that's an interesting question because you would think, you know, you wouldn't have to bother going back and getting them. It's possible that uh, they were worried uh, that if they took them with the first time, that someone would notice that they had taken them and, and they would have been followed. And that certainly, Lehi didn't want that. I think, I think the Lord clearly understood that this was going to be a challenge, plus a real teaching opportunity for Laman and Lemuel who were going to struggle. And, uh, and they're going to find out just how hard it is. And, and it's going to be important that they're a safe distance away because lives are going to be in danger. Obviously, uh, without the Lord's intervention here, uh, uh, they could have uh, been killed, all, uh, all four of the boys and, and others. So I think that uh, the Lord really knew what he was doing and gives this long period of time that they're away to try to reach out to Laman and Lemuel as well. I think it's also a kind of a testing ground for them. Um, it's certainly a test for Laman and Lemuel. How are they going to react? And it also becomes a bit of a testing ground for Nephi. Back in chapter 2, we've had him that the Lord had told him too. If you keep my commandments, you will prosper. Well, here's the first chance for Nephi to put that declaration into to practice. Um, is he going to respond to that? Is he really going to say, um, the Lord has done something, okay, I'm willing to do it. And we get that wonderful, wonderful statement that he makes in chapter three, verse seven, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. Um, and so I think that that's a very important see it in, chap in relation to chapter two. He gets the commandment now, and now he's putting it into practice. I think it's also a, a, an opportunity for uh, Sariah to test her own faith, to find out how faithful she is. And as we see in chapter five, she, she comes through. Mm -hmm. She comes through. It's a struggle for her, but she, mm -hmm. she, she comes through. I, um, we see Nephi begin to assume the role that he's going to occupy throughout the, the, rest, of his, uh, the rest of the time that he's, he's on the face of the earth here. This is a time for him to emerge and, and to justify the position that he'll eventually assume in spite of what his brethren th thinks uh, he's deserving of. And yet it seems when they're going back, of course, that <clears throat> Laman is, as the older one, seems to, seems to me at least to be in charge and is given uh, the right to determine who's going to go or how they're going to determine who's going to go before Laban to inquire of the plates. And it's my own personal view that uh, uh, rather than just as the oldest, I should be the one to go, he's looking for a cop out. And so he's going to say, we'll, we'll cast lots. And uh, this is the way that the Lord would manifest his will. But I think indeed, uh, because Laman is not really believing, he's thinking, here's three out of four chances I've got to not have to go do this. And, it, and I think the Lord fixes it. I'm sure that he wants to make sure that Laman knows just how hard and impossible this is. So that when they do finally get the plates, there's no way he could really think we got the plates or even that Nephi got the plates, that somehow the Lord's going to have to intervene here for them to get these plates. I mean, there's precedence for God to work that way. You think of um, Gideon. Mm -hmm. When he had to choose, reduce his forces to make sure there'd be no question that it was it was God who was going to bring them deliverance and accomplish this miracle, not not the arm of flesh. And it's appropriate that, that Laban, being the oldest, gets that first chance sure. to do this. Yep. He should be the one leading out, shouldn't he? That's yes. right. Yeah. But from the very beginning, with Nephi's testimony, we see he is the one leading out. I will go and do. I'm, I'm, you know, just for verse seven of chapter three, I'm glad God sent them back yes. to get the plate so we could have this. Yeah. You think of the doctrine taught in verse seven. I mean, we always marvel at how wonderful Nephi is and his great courage and faith. But the doctrine there is profound, where he says, um, I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he hath commanded them. That is so fundamental to our faith. You think about what the consequences would be if God gave commandments we could not keep. 
he'd cease to be just, he'd cease to be fair, he'd, he'd cease to be God. And, but Nephi knows that. He doesn't know how, but he knows. And, and it's that statement then that leads his father to recognize in verse 8 that his son has had his heart softened, that he has that spiritual testimony. Uh, because he recognizes in the tone that, that Nephi speaks it in that, that Nephi knows now this is the right thing. But it's still going to be a little bit of a test for Nephi, right? Because even though the Lord is going to provide a way, he doesn't provide it immediately for him. And he has, still has to do a lot of work and, and all of the brothers do. But it's not this thing, the Lord will bless you and it happens immediately so you get that immediate reward coming back. Nephi's faith is still going to be put to the test here as he sees them making the efforts to go and do it and, and it failing and having to try again and having it failing. But ultimately his faith is that the Lord will provide a way. And so that's why he, he, he wants to keep going when Laman and Lemuel want to go back because he's committed to go and do, not just to go and try like Laman and Lemuel. Yeah, he's he's goal-oriented. I mean, the, 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 the prophet has set out what the goal is, obtain the plains. And Nephi is not going to stop until he's obtained the plains. And even when he makes his, the third attempt alone, he really doesn't know exactly what he's Absolutely. going to do either. Yep. But he, he just knows he's got to go and get the job done. Nephi seems to have understood the importance of these plates. I wonder if, if the boys knew. Uh, Nephi seems to come, but maybe we, we ought to just, uh, what if, why are these plates so important? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting when we look at the whole story, the whole story here, the, uh, the Lord's going to tell them that the a whole nation will dwindle in unbelief. So it's going to preserve for them, as we read later, their history. Uh, the records of the prophecies of the Jews. It's going to preserve for them the prophecies of the Holy Prophets. It's going to preserve the commandments. It's, it's going to, all of these things that, uh, and we're going to see later in the Book of Mormon, a group, the Mulekites, who come without a record. And indeed, the very things the Lord said would happen have happened to them. They, they're in a state of, uh, of civil war among themselves. The Mulekites are. They're in a state where they've lost belief in God, their language. Become, everything that, that you would think would happen that would lead society to destruction has happened to them because they haven't had had the scripture. So the point here is you just really need scripture if you're going to do well in this world and in life. And, and we're going to see this theme run throughout the whole of the Book of Mormon. Think about the times when people are leaving the scriptures alone and they turn back to the scriptures and get their act together. The Lord's going to keep reminding us again, and this is one of the first, how important it is to have the word. So they're on the way to get the word and you're not going to make it well in life without the Word. I think one of the questions though here is why is Laban so insistent in hanging on to them, right? Um, why would they, <clears throat> obviously they're important not just for the reasons that Clyde has mentioned, but he has a sense that these are important and he doesn't want to give them up. And I think that that kind of fits in with kind of what's going on in the larger milieu. There is this sense of records are important at this time. We know that, is it Ashurbanipal in Assyria is collecting libraries and he's wanting to keep texts. And so this sense of history um, is coming through here that, that's important. We need to have records. And so Laban wants to hold on to them. And the, and the records, I think, also give a sense of... Um, right to leadership or it's certainly going to be that way with the Nephites and the Lamer but there's something important in them not just for the religious reasons but that would make Laban want to hang on to them it's as much as he does. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Point. So they make the trip down, they get there and we, we read of, of Laman making the initial attempt which seems to be a pretty straightforward um, approach. We'd like, to, we'd like to have the plates. Um, what do we learn about Laban through all of this? C can you characterize him? When you speak of Laban. Himself. Laban, yeah, L-A-B-A-N. Yeah. It seems to me, of course, Laban has uh, will identify himself as a thief and a robber. He's one who uh, takes glory in his power. He he uses his armies uh, to uh, accomplish his will. Uh, you know, I I just have to say he seems to be a wicked man, and uh, and unfortunately, the Lord's going to give him chances to take another way out than how it ends up. But he's not willing to take that because of his greed for both power and money. And, uh, and, and position. As, and it's position, the, it's absolutely. The, absolutely. the power position. And, that, and thus it'll cost him his life, though the Lord's given him plenty of chances to have it happen otherwise. And, and he apparently, according to the genealogy, uh, ties in with Lehi's uh, genealogy yeah. at some point. So uh, they're, they're at least distant, if not closer relatives. Yeah. Some wonder, why is it that Laban ends up with these plates? You know, how come and kids will ask that uh, question to me in class? And, and I think the key is that it is a record of Joseph, and perhaps because of that lineage where he is, it's, it started from a prophet. It wasn't started by a wicked man, but it's ended up because this whole nation's in apostasy in the hands of these people who are now apostate. And, and this is a doomed record, let's face it. When you're the Babylonians coming to conquer these people, you're going to be looking for records like this, not to preserve them, 
them, but to destroy them because you want to destroy a culture and a people. So you get rid of their heritage by destroying those records. So the Lord is going to preserve this record because uh, it's going to be destroyed if he doesn't. That's another reason I think we would see them needing to take this. We know about the first two failed attempts um, where Laban first refuses to give it, accuses Laman of being a robber and, and tries to, to have him killed. And then there's their attempt to purchase the records and, and that fails. Uh, quite a, uh, they really butt heads after that, the brethren do, don't they? Laban and Lemuel are ready to give up. They feel like we've tried, we're done, let's leave. I love, uh, I love the way that, that Nephi steps forward here and um, says in chapter 3, verse 15, As the Lord liveth us as we live, we will not go down unto our Father in the wilderness until we've accomplished the thing which the Lord hath commanded us. As you mentioned, Clyde, it's important that they go through these trials and hardships. I suppose God could have just um, had Laban, moved Laban to give Laban the plates when he first asked for him, but then we'd miss so much. I'd like to point out at the end of verse 13 also uh, Laban's response. He says, Behold, thou art a robber, and I will slay thee. Uh, this is a false accusation, of course. It's not the, the, the brothers who are, fault, are robbers. Laban, in the end, is going to turn out to be the robber. But making a false accusation like this uh, is breaking the Mosaic law. In Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 19, it's the law of the false witness. And as soon as he makes this false accusation of them being robbers, then he has to suffer the penalty of robbery. Oh, was that, and that a capital offense? And that's a capital offense. Mm -hmm. So right from the very first attempt, Laban has passed judgment on himself by being a false witness under the law of Moses. You know, that's an interesting perspective. I think a lot of times when we look at Nephi getting ready to slay Laban and, and really arguing with, with the revelation about doing this, we think, well, Nephi broke a lesser law to keep a higher law, maybe like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But what you're saying is Nephi's not necessarily breaking a law. He's... Um, He's doing the law. Carrying it out. Carrying it out. Be because not only is it a false witness, but then he does, he robs them of their property and sends them off again and tries to yeah. kill them. So that uh, uh, when we get over here to uh, when he's told to slay Laban, uh, you, you see what's going through Nephi's mind. So one of the other things I think that's happening here that I think is very telling is that Philemon and Lemuel are going to accuse Nephi of all sorts of things. He's going to accuse them of usurping power, trying to become a ruler and a teacher, trying to trick them by cunning arts, but they never once make the accusation of him being a murderer. I think that that's very telling that they understood what Paul is saying here, that, he's, that he isn't murdering um, Laban when he, he kills him. It's also interesting in these attempts that they make, the Lord's having him, they go through this under man's power, the first attempt to get the place, the second attempt they're using riches, which is often how we try to solve problems in the world. And it's only, and I think Nephi's always trying to do it the right way, but it's finally, when the brothers see it, the Nephi is going to say to the effect, I'm going to go, uh, led by the Spirit, I don't know how he's going to bring it about, but indeed he'll do that in chapter 4, verse 6. That will be his uh, approach. And so we see those three attempts in, in a way when we finally get it right and go under the Lord's power, we're more likely to make the right choice and to get the, the solution that we would uh, have, or at least the Lord would like us to have in our, in our dealing with problems as well. I'd like to mention too, uh, before we get into the sure. third attempt where Nephi <laughs> actually does retrieve the plates, uh, at the end of chapter 3, uh, where Laman and Lemuel now are really upset with Nephi and Sam and are, are wailing on them. And the angel comes and says, what are you doing this for? Don't you really know that he's supposed to be the leader? And so on and so forth. It's a, it, very similar to the episode with Alma the Younger in, in, uh, in Mosiah and uh, Paul on the road to Damascus. The messenger comes and says, what you're doing is wrong. You need to stop it, even if you don't want to really repent yourself. And they do. They stop wailing on, on Nephi and Sam. But uh, in verse 31, we, we learn how long the influence of an angel lasts. For them. For, for Laman and Lemuel. And basically, it's as long as the angel is there. As soon as the angel is gone, that influence is gone also. They do stop what they're doing, but they never really make a change of heart. Sorry, the other thing that I like about that, or I find interesting, is that when a the angel is saying, talking to Laman and Lemuel, he says, you're going to have to go back and do them. You're still going to have to do the plates. He's talking to them. But we all know that it's Nephi who goes alone back. So they're not even going to respond to that. The direction is to them. But it's Nephi that has to stand alone to go back and to fulfill the, the, the promise. He's, he's the only one that's got divine perspective. The others are still seeing it from their own glasses, and they can't see yes. how the four of them can take on all of Laban. And Nephi's knowing it's, it's got to be the Lord, and I don't know how, but it's going to have to be the Lord. We can't do it alone. They've, they've learned that clearly with these previous attempts. 
So Nephi goes back in the city, led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand what he should do, and he finds Laman inebriated, passed out, and the Spirit tells him to slay him. It would have been a lot easier if God had just had Laban dead there. Yes. Uh, what do you suppose he's trying to teach Nephi? I think one of the things that he's teaching is that, it, again, it's this progression for Nephi. When they first came out of the wilderness, Nephi needed to know and had to have a divine witness that his dad was a prophet of God. Here, I think when, one of the things that Nephi is needing to learn is as, as important and as critical it is to have that testimony of a prophet. There are some things that we need to have a personal witness of. Um, and so when the Spirit does this, asks him to, or tells him to do this, he hesitates a little bit. There is no, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded here. He's going to hesitate a little bit and really think through, through this through. Am I sure that this is what the Spirit is telling me to do? And so he's very sure about that before he moves on. But now he's learnt the lesson that in addition to having testimonies of the prophets of the Word of God, we have to have personal witnesses to move forward as well as we go forth in the work of the Lord. And I think it's a personal witness about Nephi's character here too because the first time the Spirit tells him to kill Laban, he says, Never at any time have I shed the blood of man, and I shrank and would that I might not slay him. He can't do it, yeah. even though he knows it's the Spirit telling him that. This is just the kind of a character he is, this, this wonderful person. So in, in verse 11 there of chapter 4, the Spirit tells him again to slay him. And, and here you can see these thoughts going through Nephi's mind. Uh, he's robbed us. He's taken our property. He's tried to kill us under the law of Moses. These are all legitimate reasons for killing him. You have to remember in those days they didn't have police. They didn't have regular court systems and, and execution chambers. You just, you just did the law of Moses. And if there were questions about it, it, it came up before the elders in the gate, the city gate. And they would decide whether you handled appropriately or not. So it's up to Nephi now to carry out the law of Moses. And even then, when he, when he knows that under the law of Moses, Laban must die, at the end of verse 11, he still can't kill him. So he's gone through, I'm, I'm a good person, I can't do it. Uh, Laban uh, should be killed, I can't do it. And so the Spirit tells him the third time in verse 12, slay him for the Lord hath delivered him into your hands. And then the reasoning shifts. Now it shifts away from, from law of Moses and other worldly concerns to what does the Lord really want? And so you see the trial that Nephi is going through here. I really do need to do what the Lord wants me to do, not because of all these other reasons, but because it's the Lord. And that's an important step in the stone. And once he's reached that point, it gets easier for him, doesn't it? I mean, something is going on when he goes to Zoram. He's large in stature. I wonder how well Laban's armor fit him. I wonder if he really was a gifted mimic and could, could really... Uh, well, his brothers accuse him later on, remember, of trickery. So it, yeah. it may be that uh, he was good at it. And, and yet, when we look at this whole account, and I, I think of, you know, it's for the righteous purposes this is being done. And Nephi can't fully know all those righteous purposes right. yet. He'll know later when we see the, the visions he receives in chapters uh, uh, 10 through 14. But, but when he comes to Zoram, and, and some people want to present it so dark they couldn't see, but when they're even out in the dark and from a distance, his brothers think that it's Laban. But when he calls to them, his voice clearly from a distance they know is Nephi, and so they stop. And that's when Zoram's going to start to try to run and hightail it. And Nephi uh, you know, brings, uh, brings him down, and, and the question comes, so why does Zoram have to go with them? And I think it's not just the fact that if, if he doesn't, then he could tell on them. But in reality, Zoram's the only other person who has witnessed this deliverance, oh. the deliverance of the Word. Mm -hmm. And the Word now that they're going to need, and that will literally preserve not just their nation, but it's preserving this nation and any in the world who believe it. It's, as we'll read later from Nephi, it's this record that will give the Gentiles in the latter days the last chance to, to save themselves from going down to destruction. And Nephi couldn't have known all of that, but Zoram can bear witness. I, I tell you, his voice sounded different and he looked different. Somehow the Lord, I think, was magnifying Nephi and Zoram would be the only other witness. So we've got two witnesses of this deliverance because Zoram's there. Can you imagine what they're teaching Zoram on the way back on the two, the two week trip back down to the Red Sea? I wish I could have been privy to some of those discussions they had. <laughs> Meanwhile, what's happening back at home? But don't forget too about Zoram. You have to have another person along because Ishmael has five daughters. Yeah, Remember that? That's right. You know, God is such a good <laughs> stage director. He yeah. just seems to move people. That's right. Yeah. Okay, now back to the question. Meanwhile, what's going on back at home while the boys are, are off? 
Well, this is a difficult time for mum, for Soraya. Um, the boys have been gone for a long period of time and it's taking longer than what she had anticipated. And, and she begins to worry about this and, and, and to ask questions. I think, Even questioning if Lehi really is a yeah, prophet. Yeah, this, this must have been a terribly difficult time for her. Because when you think about it, Lehi left Jerusalem having had a revelation. He knew that God um, wanted him to do, but Soraya had no revelation like that. She went along because she, he was her husband and things like this. But I see this as being the fact that the boys come home safely for Soraya is her witness from the Lord that her husband is a prophet and this is God's will. Once she has that witness, we don't hear her murmuring again. And it seems to me now she knows and she can go off into the journey knowing that they're obeying God's will. So her testimony came from witnessing this miracle. Yeah. And maybe that's another reason why God wanted the boys to have this experience, to bring Sarai along as well. Yeah, this is another deliverance. She's been delivered from a trial and a test here and we're just seeing these all over the place. Surely it was a happy reunion. Now when we get to chapter six, we have kind of just a little editorial note here from Nephi saying, now I'm keeping this record. I know the record is true. I'm writing the things that are really pleasing to God, but not so much uh, pleasing to, to man, so to speak. But he writes this just to mention that he, they learned from this that they were descendants of Joseph. And they learned that from the plates of brass, which contains a genealogy. What else does, real quickly, what else do the plates of brass contain? The books of Moses, um, the prophecies of the prophets down to Jeremiah. But what's interesting here, and this is different from our Hebrew Bible, is that we're also going to, in, in addition to prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, we're also going to get the prophets of Zenus and Zenic and Nahum. Um, and so we've got some additional information here that, that don't end up in the, in the Bible that we have here. That may reflect that Laban's records were, from, were representative of a northern collection of scripture rather than just the right, southern Some kid. suggest maybe Laban fled, uh, the, uh, Laban's forefathers fled when, uh, in 721 when they fell to Assyria and right. that's what they were doing in the kingdom of Judah. But those prophecies become very, very important <laughs> very in, this, in this book. Now chapter seven, they're back, they've read the records and now it's time for them to uh, uh, to go back to Jerusalem. This time dad sends them back. This time not for records, but for wives. wives. For wives. No murmuring this time. Yeah, yeah Laman and Lemuel are on this one. <laughs> they're, they're with us the whole way, at, at, least, at least the journey to Jerusalem. Yeah. Yes. So what do you hope your students learn from chapter seven, this whole experience of going back for wives? What are the key points? One of the things ought to be about, uh, this is one of the key places to talk about the importance of marriage and, and that the Lord really, I mean, otherwise, why bother to go back and get this other family if you don't need marriage and it's not essential? And it just is, it, it seems to, to us illogical, but it's the order of heaven and it's necessary and quite a remarkable family when you think that it's gonna line up as it does. And apparently people are willingly marrying, I often think, what a wonderful thing to have someone to marry Nephi, but who's going to marry Laman and Lemuel? And they seem to do so very willingly, but it, it works out. And Most and couples deserve each other, don't they? Uh, yeah, Laman and Lemuel. That's right. That seems to be yes, the case. I got it. And, and, and you get the idea that yeah. Nephi probably married the gal that stuck up for him when his brother and tied him Verse 19, you think yeah. there's a little romance going on there? And yeah, seven, probably already chapter started. Chapter 7, verse 19, when she rescues him. Yeah. She, she may have had her eye on him already, but uh, I think there's a, a, along with that, we, you have to say that, that in their journey down to probably the southern tip of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, there were plenty of places where they could have picked up wives. What's going on here is you've got to get wives from the covenant, the covenant people. That's you can't pick them up along the way. Right kind of marriage. Right kind of marriage. Very yeah. good. Yeah. And the fact that they come, of course, as verse 5 tells us, is that all of them, not just Ishmael, their hearts were softened. Now, they may have wondered, well, okay, this is great to go get, who's really want to come? We didn't want to go, and, and, and yet the Lord will soften their hearts. I think that's important. Ishmael must have been a truly remarkable man, and his daughters as well. Yeah. I suspect all of them had experiences that, that helped confirm what they were doing and who they should marry. So when it's all said and done, Paul, why don't you tell us, what, what are the main concepts then that we hope we get out of these chapters uh, 3 through 7? Well, it, it begins over there, actually, I think, uh, with, with where Nephi begins his record, which is actually in, in 1 Nephi chapter 2, verse 16, after we have the introduction of his father. And then from chapter 2, verse 16, through the end of chapter 7, it's, it's the beginning of Nephi's record. And he's going to teach us some very important things. One of them is, now that he's received his confirmation, he's ready to go forth and do the work of the Lord. And this in spite of opposition from his brothers. Uh, also, uh, we'll, we'll see that, um, that every one of them receives their trial in this period. 
uh, Nephi does, Laman and Lemuel do, and their mother, Sariah, also receives her trial in this period. And they make it through with flying colors. I, I think there's something else that, that the text points out, and that is the, the Old Testament background of these people. They knew their Old Testament, they knew their law of Moses, and they're trying to live by it. As soon as the sons come back with the plates, what do they do? They make an offering to the Lord, a burnt offering. As soon as they come back with uh, Ishmael and his family, uh, there at the very end of chapter seven, uh, the, uh, they offer again the, the same kind of sacrifice they, they offered. They did offer sacrifice and burnt offerings unto the Lord in fulfillment of Exodus chapter 10, verse 25. Uh, these are people who are trying to do the law of the Lord and live it to their best and who have that burning testimony in their heart of what all of this means, at least Lehi and Nephi do. <laughs> and we're hoping the whole time that Laman and Lemuel get the message and get on board. And it sets up the, the rest of the text of the Book of Mormon. Nicely summarized. Thank you so much.